Okay. Welcome to the Witch Wavelength podcast, Sue. Oh, thank you so much for asking me to come on this. <laughs> an absolute pleasure. <laughs> well, you folks haven't seen what's gone on before this, but it's a classic. <laughs> it's probably going <laughs> to... We'll stick it on TikTok and it'll have 5,000 hits within two minutes. How to not oh. use an office chair, <laughs> but never mind. Oh, I've, I've got many oh, uses for office chairs, but there you go. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Anyway, yeah, okay. We'll just ha we'll have to do some magic on this, all right? So be still, stay where you are. <laughs> I am. Okay, right. <laughs> Let's be serious. At the, but at the same time, you know, that is really what this is all about, isn't it? It's being ourselves. I mean, I don't try and be anything I'm not. And I know you don't. Um, we're, we're too long in the tooth for all that, aren't we, Sue? Let's face it. I've always been like it. I've always been very open and honest about yeah. things. Yeah. And um, yeah, sometimes it's brilliant. And sometimes it can lead you into stormy waters. But, you know, there you go. <laughs> There you go. But, you know, I am the person I am. And I think I'm very much like my mother was, really straight and hilarious. <laughs> I, I've got the hilarious gene inside me and so have you. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, she, we were always laughing. We were always laughing. And um, she taught me to be myself and be natural. Just be yourself. Don't try to put a a face on or anything like that yeah, but believe it or, yeah believe it or not I'm actually quite shy now you wouldn't believe that but it's true and yeah. um in my real self at home you know you're in I'm in my home now with my recording studio behind me I'm quite a quiet person but then when I go out I'm on that stage and um that brings out something completely different. And even as a child, I was always making little theatres, making people watch it and stuff like that. Um, so that's been going all the way through my life, uh, having two completely different sides. Mm. I'm quite quiet in some ways and very private. And then in other ways, when you stand on stage, you're not private, are you? <laughs> so, no, but, you're definitely not. And, and there's that shamanic side, you know, as well. So that also yeah. comes from my mother. Yeah. You know, she, she was a magical practitioner and she uh, lived in Devon and Cornwall. So she was in um, a lot of circles down there and was well known by the Pagan Federation as well. And when she passed... Um, obviously uh, we had the pandemic stuff but after the pandemic uh, last year she was honoured by them and um, her picture was up it was in the Glastonbury one because you know the Pagan Federation is all over the country and yeah. uh, her photo was up and um, she was honoured over you know the um, they they stopped and did a prayer for her. It's because she was like this um, wild witch of the West. She had massive red hair, and boy, wow. she did lose her temper <laughs> occasionally. So that is a picture of my mum. Oh, lovely! You see it? Yeah. yeah. What was so, her name? Though? Her her name was Sylvia Rose Garvey. But then she married, uh, my mum was married five times, quite interesting. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, some of them died. <laughs> I'm not saying it was anything to do with witchcraft. They were old. <laughs> they were old. <laughs> but um, she would um, obviously celebrate the, you know, wheel of the year and uh, would have pictures taken by her altar. And her last love was her true love. She always said, this is my true love. And they only had six years together. And oh. uh, sort of a bit like myself, I had a real true love. Um, I was married 33 years, but my real true love um, 
he passed and you never know what is coming round the corner, do you? You never know what's coming yeah. round the corner. But she taught me about fairies and about all the stuff down in Devon. And she was also into art and artists. There were a lot of artists down on the um, at the end of uh, Cornwall. Loads of art, artists down that way. And she lived in St Just at one point and then in Penzance another. And then she finished her life in Brixham, which is a fishing village. And, well, more than a village now, isn't it? So uh, just to give you a little example how she believed in the fairies, I one day, uh, she had them all around the garden and little guardians and that, and I have them now myself. And uh, I took a photo of one. Oh, that wasn't right. <laughs> you don't take pictures of uh, her guardians. And she said, you to wipe that picture out immediately. So I was like, oh, bit of a slap on the wrist there, Mum. And she had her own stone circle and lived very much like I sort of live. I've got an acre of land. I've got planted my own orchard. And um, I've got little things all around the garden now. And I've gone, don't touch that. And I thought, oh, I'm like my mum. Stop it now. <laughs> <laughs> she was around when Gerald Gardner was about. She was um, uh, an acquaintance of uh, the Farrars. Um, and she, if she's severely dyslexic, like I am, and like my son is, and my whole side of that family is severely dyslexic, but they're very, very um, creative. So um, she's a published poet, her last name was Statham, and under the name of Sylvia Rose Garvey, uh, and Shannon Rose, under the name of Shannon Rose, a lot of her poetry uh, was published, but she would record it into a tape recorder, which is what I used to do. Do you remember the TDK tape recorders? Yeah. 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 Um, so uh, when she passed, I've kept all the recordings so oh, I can wow. hear her voice. And on oh. the end of one of my songs, uh, let me see, I have three titles for every single song that I do, which drives my band bonkers. What's it called? It's called In the Arms <laughs> of the Goddess. Well, I've got, I've got Mother Earth here. Well, I've got Gaia down. It's the same song. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> How many titles have you got for this one? Oh, only just the one. Are you sure? And it's called Lessons of Rebirth. And so my fantastic recording engineer managed to take my mum's voice speaking some of her poetry oh, and put wow. it on the end of that song. Oh, amazing. Cry. I had to look for it. It was she was with the BBC and she was um uh, reading her poetry and it fitted in with the theme. And the this album this uh, in the arms of the goddess album is a rebirth album and a collaboration and i've got into a lot of collaborations which is basically what we're doing here now isn't it really yeah yeah and the collaboration was unusually i think unusually with a artist naomi cornack oh i've got one of her oracle decks well, the new Oracle deck, the middle card. Is that one? Yeah, she's put it in. I was really pleased and chuffed. And it's we she came and stayed here and it's the yew tree, my mother yew tree in my forest. So mm. you've got the yew tree and the mother yew tree and me as a young priestess coming all the way round to here. This is laterally inverted, isn't it? I don't know what I'm doing, which side. You'll have to use your eyes. It's the Kyliak on the other side. So me as a young priestess here. Yeah. And then all the summer things. And then coming around the top, right down to the other side here, which is the white heart of magic. And me as a Kyliak. And the um, butterflies at the top is like rebirth. And so are the dragonflies and she's holding the water of life. I have right next to me a full size banner of that. 
And we did it this way. No money exchanged hands. No, she lovely. stayed in my yurt. Um, I do Airbnb sometimes, but it wasn't that. And um, she stayed on holidays. And um, I... I didn't expect the original artwork, but she actually gave me the original artwork. Stunning. Stunning. Um, I took out, with our little perambulation, so I can still find it. (laughs) (laughs) Now, you were asking before about the gathering. See the three little bears? Mm. Different, the song, the gathering... Uh, sometimes, as you know, uh, you being a prolific songwriter, um, sometimes they just come to you. The witchy tree one was gifted by the tree. That's the tree uh, in the picture. That's the mm. tree. And that was on my other album, the Celestial Stones one. Um, mm. But the gathering came from me seeing on a video somewhere i don't even remember now three little bears dancing and that's her drawing that's her pen and ink drawing of them and three little bears were dancing and in my head and we're talking nearly 10 years ago now in my hair was where bears dance in a forest clearing came i didn't know what i was going to do with it you know i just filed it away didn't think about it and then I started to write in the arms of the goddess. And as as I was writing the song, she was visioning the pictures. So I was, mm-hmm. we became connected. We actually knew when we were doing a line. I said, I've got stuck on the fox bit on this one. Oh, she said, I'm painting a fox now. And I went, oh, right, okay. So it became like that it was a very interesting uh, project mm. to do magical uh, very magical she's a magical mm. person she only paints by you know magical intuition so mm. uh the gathering um is about animals and people the animals are there already and the video was a real video of three little bears who had their paws together and were actually upright dancing. It wasn't AI or anything like that. And it was some Norwegian couple just quickly filmed it. And then they had to run because the big mother bear came and they had to get out of the way. But it always interested me that bears dance. (laughs) Baby bears do apparently get up on their hind legs and were like going foot to foot. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. in my imagination, which is weird, <laughs> I, I, I imagine the animals were dancing in a forest clearing, and then from the hill coming down, uh, a procession of witches with lights, processional lights, and they come down and they join, and they can hear what the animals are saying, and the animals can hear what they're saying. And so that's the way the whole thing started, uh, that one. Mm. Mm. But the main question I wanted to start with was, what is the hereditary shaman and a witch? And I know that you've been heavily influenced, of course, by your lovely mum. And so you've explained that she was was that way inclined. She was a witch and a shaman. Um, but didn't wasn't the the sacred witchy tree? Isn't that the the tree? That's to do with your mum as well, isn't it? Um, the, or was the, it? This, no. The the the, the, the sacred sense, the tree the, work, the, the tree the tree that you wrote sacred witchy tree about. This is the same tree here, which right. this is yeah. the tree. Um, well, she yeah. taught me to uh, honor trees. And to it, this is off the Celestial Stones album, which was all going to be about stones, but ended up not being about stones. And sometimes something comes to you. Um, both my mum, myself, 
and another female of our family um, have predictions and um, can second sight, I suppose you'd call it. And, it, and it's not actually what I want at all, because sometimes it's not nice what you discover in a dream or something. And I used to phone her up and say, what does this mean? And she'd go, ah, OK. And we'd have a big discussion. And now I don't have that. I can't have that discussion with her. So, um, you know, my son is like it as well. But... So talking to trees and being given things. So trees and folklore is what she taught me. She taught me about folklore. Now, it's an old fashioned word folklore now, but she told me what that plant does, why it's there and herbs, which was handed down, let me say, from my grandmother to her, which is, her name was Gwendolyn. What a fabulous name, I love it. And mm. she was also a poet and a singer. And uh, she was a violinist in the BBC Orchestra. Uh, so, Philharmonic Orchestra? Yeah, she was a violinist anyway. So mm. that gene goes down. Um, not just through the female line, because my, my son can sing as well. But, you know, he doesn't use that at the moment, but he is a creator. And um, his speciality um, for many, many years, he used to be on, um, yeah, it was called Dark Masters. And you oh, can pick up the Masters of Darkness. Sorry, that's my dyslexia. Master Dark. There's little video clips of it. And he was like, didn't have a script written down, but he would talk about stuff. And his particular interest and he's got bookshelves of uh, stuff about Alistair Crowley. So even, yeah, even filmmakers went to him to find out different facts and things from America. And he still, he's got a chapter that he wrote um, part in um, Alex, Alexander Cabot's book, Touched by the Goddess. No, and uh, he wrote, he wrote, he said, I want, I've got this thing, um, I need some, I want Aaron to write. And of course, Aaron's really dyslexic. That he went, no, 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 I can't do writing. I can't do that. And I, I badgered him during the pandemic. And finally he did. And now he's glad. So mm. and his connection, and he would talk to my, his grandmother, to Sylvia, about this connection. And he did things... He's a physical person, but he went out with film companies to the big pyramid and actually did the great writing there. Oh, wow. There's not many people who have done that. He went to Sicily and uh, it was all fenced off into the Alistair Crowley's temple that was there. He's the wow. only person who's got photographs of the pictures. They're pretty oh. horrendous, but... Um, they're gone now because all the plasters come off the walls. So mm. he's finally put those together. So there is this sort of going down the line type mm. thing. I think that's what you're sort of asking. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I never felt it was unnatural. And at the age of sort of like seven, and I grew up in a, an, a normal house. I had a, a stepmother later on. And I would say, oh, I've just seen that over there. And I was about, <laughs> you should go, Susan, you know, stop telling lies type thing. And I was like, well, I am, I'm seeing it over there. And I sort of, I think as a child, you have, we have magical children and you begin to not say what you've just oh. seen. Um, mm. And so... I knew what I saw, but I thought, is there anyone else like this? You know? <laughs> <laughs> my first sort of, I was in Cyprus, uh, my parents were in the army, and um, my first real big magical experience was um, I used to go and sit under a 
a factory. Now, my sister thought I was going to the factory. She thought I was going to a factory to work. I was only about 10. I was about eight, eight or 10. And um, no, I was going to the fat tree, Three. which was a huge, a huge carob tree. Oh, very, very wow. old carobs. So the carobs yeah. would be hanging, and I'd be sitting there munching because it's sweet, very sweet. It's got a particular taste. And I'm sat there. And this black snake comes across and sits down, curls itself up in the sun right beside me. And I could hear it speaking. So we had a bit of a conversation, me and this snake. And then I took my carob, went back, and then I mentioned it to my parents. And they went mad because it was uh, a deadly snake, a deadly snake. Oh. Bite, <laughs> and you might not yeah. live because I'd have to come through the mount up through the mountainside and to the, where the sheep were and all the rest of it and come back. But that was like, I absolutely love this song, Sacred Witchy Tree. Can oh, so, right, I'll tell you how that came to me. <laughs> okay, it is that tree in the picture, and it has been up. through my life. It's in a little wood, blue, blue bell wood, blue. Blue harebell is a hair, lots of harebell, blue harebell wood. And it's just up near uh, Wilton. And there used to be a great big grove there. And uh, the Forestry Commission, every so often, do chop some of the trunks off, uh, the, the arms that stretch. But they should not be cut off because the way that they grow in the grove is to put their arms down and then their little trees grow up from their arms. Yeah. And in a churchyard, mm. the reason they planted yew trees is because they were worshipped. Tree mm. worship was way before the standing stones. And so the trees came first, the standing stones mm. came next. They smashed the standing stones up and built the church on the spot. That's, that's at Tisbury, uh, where there's, uh, you can see where the circle of trees was. So mm. I was in a lot of trouble. I had a lot of stuff that had happened to me. And this was like of a personal nature. And, uh, you know, loves. <laughs> mm. Heartbroken. And I went to the tree and I said, help me, sacred witchy tree. And I've done this study of yew trees for about two years. I've been up to the one up near Conwy, which is 6,000 years old, and seen the mother tree. And so I was absolutely prostrate, flat down. Couldn't do that now because I can't get up on my own. <laughs> so I'm flat down. And I went, help me, sacred witchy tree. And the tree gifted me a lot of the song in one go woof wow and i thought what am i going to write it down on i'll forget mm. so you know i said thank you and everything and i ran back to my car and i had an atlas you know a road map and on the back of the road map i wrote help me sacred witchy tree i cannot be here with thee mm. Watching humans is a past. So it came to me that the yew tree was telling me of the things of the past, that there'd been mm. lovers trysted underneath it, that there'd been battles, and many of the yew trees had been cut down for um, arrows, and about the arrows being poisonous, and about it being used by the the druids and other priestesses that if you failed in battle you took the ground up arrows and killed yourself but the other side to a yew tree is it's psychotoxic therapy for cancer so there there are lots of different sides wow. but the story of the fairies and you falling asleep under a tree never go to sleep in the summer under a tree because it is constantly dropping its poison around you and you will fall asleep 
if you sit under a yew tree in the summer. Mm. So the, the chorus, the verse is about humans, about the silly little things that have happened in its, you know, I believe my mother yew tree must be a thousand years old. So, and she still has her arms now. And little trees grow up from it. They come up from the arms. But it, in the chorus, it's the tree speaking. Mm. I was here before the stones. I was here before the bones. I was here before the cross. I've been here long, long time, time long. lost. Yeah. Tree I love it. Life, tree of life, history hold. Mighty trunks are gnarled and gold. So the chorus changes as we mm. go through it, but that's the intention. It, and that was given to me. The other one on the other album, which was extremely personal because my mother had passed and so had my partner. And uh, it was so sorrow laden. I thought, I can't put this on. And Paul, my Paul Gulliver, my recording artist, said, yes, you must do this. It must go on. But I thought, no, no, there's no chorus in it. You know, I, I do think of my audience, but not all the time. I just do things. So what do I call mm. it here? Yes, officially, it's called Rest Your Soul. And unofficially, sleep, sleep. But the hook, as you might say, or whatever, which made me, yes, it can go on, well, came to me in a dream the night before he mm. was finishing it. It went, oh, I have to put something else on. I went, yes, you do. And what came to me was, <clears throat> you know, I've been to a festival, my voice is nearly gone, but here we go. <laughs> it, and... It, come, it goes like this. I hear you call. I hear you call. I hear you call. I hear you call. And after the pandemic, I'll get goose gogs when I sing that. After the mm -hmm. pandemic, so many people had lost loved ones mm. that I thought I'll chance it I did it at the assembly rooms in Glastonbury and I said I'm going to do this song and we're going to call to your ancestors and possibly people you've lost a long time ago but recently so I had a room full of people doing that I hear you call and I mm. thought yeah they actually need this song this is something they need and I handed out a whole bag of crystals that were my mum's to people in the audience. And I thought, yes, it is a song I will do now. And mm. um, and it's, it, but very, very personal things. You think, not quite sure about that. <laughs> but, mm. Mm. you know, that one, the hook, which is was my mother speaking to me from mm. I Hear You Call, so called mm. them call the ancestors i do remember i do remember being at a drum and voice workshop that you did it was only last sawain um here in oh, essex yes. that's where oh, we kind yes. of talked about you coming on the podcast wasn't it and you yeah. did you sang that song and we all sang with you and it was really poignant because it was at sawain you know and that that yes. sort of connection with the ancestors yes it, it is a sort of in in yes. other people's heads but how songs come to you that one mm -hmm. um obviously that was in in my mind it, things are there aren't they in the back of your mind but mm -hmm. i went for an appointment in the hospital um for something to do with my hands and um i'm sat there and the song comes to me Sleep, sleep, rest your soul on a blood-soaked sacred earth. Sleep, sleep, rest your soul on a blood-soaked sacred earth. And immediately I thought, oh my God, my recording engineer won't like that. There's too many S's in it. Sleep, sleep. 
<laughs> he goes, no S's. <laughs> and I thought, it's too late. And I thought, what am I going to write it on? So I wrote it on the back of the appointments uh, thing. Yeah. And the lady goes, oh, thank you very much, uh, Miss Paramore. And she goes to take the sheet. And I go, no, you can't have it. It's got a song on the back. <laughs> <laughs> so that didn't come to me in a magical place, but it maybe it oh. came to me. It reminded me. Yeah. How how has living near? Because I mean, you live in a, an amazing place. How has living near Stonehenge focused your service to the goddess? Because that's what you do, isn't it? That's your whole life is serving the goddess in some way, shape, or form. So it is. do you think? It, yeah, how, how has living near Stonehenge influenced you in that way and focused Greatly. you? Mm. Greatly. Um, I used to go to Avebury a terrific amount, and I still do. I just mm. did um, uh, the first bardic evening that they had there, and I constantly go back there. And I was hand at Avebury because there are oh. no guards <laughs> and you can walk in for free. And it does draw me the place. But Callanesh draws me in Scotland as well, and so does Brinkethley on the Isle of Anglesey. But Stonehenge in particular, um, as a Druid, um, you know, I belong to Obod and many other Druid um, associations. Um, it, it has that open days, you know, they gratefully um, let us in. <laughs> We call them English heretics. They gratefully let us in at some ungodly hour of like six o'clock. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. I don't think anyone in church goes to church at six o'clock in the morning, but never mind. Mm. <laughs> because the place has to earn money. Mm. And uh, I became a member of the war band. Just like, you know, you have a journey and sometimes mm. a path crosses you. And then you stay on that little bit of a path with that person in parallel. And then you cross over and you go somewhere else and you do other things. So that became quite a thing. And I was reliable to turn up because I'm literally 20 minutes from Stonehenge, whether it was snowing, whether it was hailing or <laughs> whatever happened. And so I mm. became um, quite often the priestess for Arthur Pendragon and... Um, or a lot of the other priests that go there because I turned up. <laughs> but um, what's he like? <clears throat> so what's Arthur Pendragon like? I've read I've read a book that was written by somebody called Christopher Stone. Do you know Christopher Stone? He's a yeah, writer. I've got, I've got two of the books up there. He's yeah. now taken over. Well, he's a very interesting character. And I mean, as time goes by, he's mellowed a bit. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> Well, <laughs> um, he has fought for many of our rights. Mm. We are allowed to have pagan priests in prisons because he spent a lot of his time in prison trying to get Stonehenge opened up again. He chained himself mm. to the fence back in the mm. 80s. Yeah. He's done, uh, he was with the Newbury Bypass. Mm. All sorts of things. Now, whether you believe in everything he does, or whether you don't, I'm telling you, there's a lot of pagan things that we would not have without him constantly going to the high court, standing outside, shouting. Now, mm. I'm, I'm not a person who likes shouting outside places, but... If I wore a mask, it was okay. <laughs> so, so I used to wear a mask. Um, but it isn't, I'm not a natural protester, but I did protest mm. about the bones. He, we were promised by the archaeologist that the bones that were taken from the Aubrey holes uh, would be put back and to rebalance, you know, how would you like it if I went to a local church lot and dug up your mum and dad and your great-grandfather? No, thanks. And we want them put back. 
And so the pro the particular essence of that one was bring back the bones. Mm. And we shouted for hours and hours till we had no voice outside the brand new. Um, well, it looks like a building shopping centre, doesn't it? Um, near Stonehenge, the Stonehenge shopping centre. So he will protest about things like that. The tunnel, obviously. Um, so he's like more of the political side of mm. Druidism. And whether you personally like him or you don't like him, he does those things. You know, he's not afraid to do that. He will go to court. He will go to prison just to make that point. And very mm. often we get a right from it. And another right was to carry because the, um, you know, uh, if you're an Arab, you're allowed to carry um, a durka, a little, little, you know, curly knife. But we weren't allowed to carry a sword to our ceremonies. We would be arrested. So he got the right. You wrap it up, obviously. And if you can prove you're going to a ceremony at Stonehenge or wherever, he won you the right to carry that as a religious thing and a thaming mm. sword. So not many people know that either. And there are many other things that, um, you know, I don't know. And But pers personally, he turns up at Stonehenge then he does it with Rollo Mulfing as Rollo goes into the centre and him as his protest does it outside uh, by the heelstone. And there will be thousands and thousands of people there at these gatherings who don't know why they're going there, but they're going there. And I'm off often, I cannot even get to the loo because I'm in my full white druid outfit. Oh, what are you? What, what's a druid? What's this? What's that? And then I will do hand fastings with him and um, but he's there and he does the ceremonies and he turns up. <laughs> so, wow. you know, um, and the press do focus on him because it's something interesting and political. And, mm. and they will try to trip him up and all sorts of different things. And he will be shipped off here and shipped off there to do interviews and things like that. So many other Druid orders, they want to keep very quiet. They just want to do the land stuff. But the mm. war band, if you join the war band, you've got to do that stuff. So mm. I'm not a protester, but I'm a turner-upper. <laughs> so I've got, mm. this is happens. This is a photo that um, another beautiful friend of mine took. Um, we were there to do a video about Merlin, actually. And the fence is here. There's a fence. So I'm just stood in front of Stonehenge. This is the Celestial Stones um, uh, talk. Uh, they did an article on me on that one. Mm. And I thought, I've got it. I've got the magazine. Oh, good. Well, I've had it yeah, for I've years got it. and years. I've got yeah. it. So oh, look. Oh, yeah. oh, jolly good. <laughs> <laughs> Infamous at last. <laughs> yeah. So but, let let me um, ask you how how long have you been doing? Have you been working or doing these services and working in ceremony at Stonehenge? How long have you been doing it? How long has that been going on for? Twenty. I say I've earned my badge. Twenty one years as a as a Drew, but um, I was going to Stonehenge and doing stuff, but I was also going there even before. Um, mm. And then because I could sing, I would always be asked to yeah. sing in circle. And then I became involved in the ceremonies mm. um, more and more and more. And then other places as well. I'm the ceremonial singer at the Mercian Gathering. I do all the ceremonial singing, if she requires it, Anna Franklin. So it's sort of like developed, you know, mm. over a period of time. And I'm umpty ump years old. <laughs> so <laughs> Adam on. <laughs> More than umpty ump years old. 
Um, and so it's just like crept in and developed. You know, I didn't mm. go straight in there and I was a priestess instantly. That doesn't no, happen. No, 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 of course it doesn't. No, you have to earn it, you have to earn your stripes. First of all, of you've got you to turn up. <laughs> mm. And, and mm. I say this and, and, and in different types of weather. So quite a few years and I've been going to Stonehenge since I was a child. Um, mm. My father was in the army in Tidworth and there were no fences. There was nothing, nothing there. And we would just go and sit on the stones, you know. Um, mm. So what do you say? Do you say being with the stones and I had the feelings and stuff when I was there? No, I wasn't a priestess or anything like that, but I was very drawn to them. So mm. it's developed over a period of time. That's what yeah. I'd say. Yeah, I've, I've got me stripes. I've got I've got me got me staff sergeant stripes. <laughs> you certainly have. You certainly have. But and, and and also your music, as you say, you were asked to sing in ceremony because you could sing. Um, yes. But that's also. I mean, your your whole singing career began when you were a kiddie, didn't it? Yes. Yes. I. Mm. I I started singing at the very early age, um, doing musicals, um, uh, you know, and I was a quite a slim little thing then, and dancing and, you know, HMS Pinafore, I think, was one of my first ones. <laughs> and so I, I, I was trained as well in, um, but for free uh, by someone who trained me to sing opera as well. So I can use the wow. upper, I'm a mezzo, I can use the upper voice. And I was head of a cathedral choir at the age of 11. And that was the one in wow. um, Ligelia in Cyprus. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, and my little blue uniform and stuff. So I was well used to being, because where you could get to sing soprano would be in a church. Um, so mm -hmm. I learned all of that. So when we get our, Jehovah Witnesses, which is another story, maybe for another day, which is hilarious. <laughs> I know my stuff. <laughs> and um, I corrupted them by giving them an apple from my orchard. <laughs> and uh, so I started very early. And then um, I went, I was always in a choir. I was always in all the shows at school. And then um, taught to sing opera at 16. And then um, went on from there to write, be in rock musicals and uh, in theatre on stage, always auditioning. And I had a background career because my parents were wise and said, you need a different career. You can't join that you need to have a proper career and I became a nurse so the other side of me is a healing oh. side I've got upstairs mm -hmm. I've got um, uh, quite a very large collection of ancient Tibetan bowls and crystal bowls and things like that so first I went to camps as Tibetan bowl Sioux that's how they, how they knew me they didn't even know I could sing and I would sit around the campfire and sing and then they went, hmm. <laughs> uh, so from there, I went to rock musicals, uh, dancing about, doing stuff and writing songs. And from there, I was in a jazz band. Now, that mm. was immense and great because uh, Ron, who was alive, oh, my picture of Ron's up there, he's passed. But he used to play sax with Ronnie Scott. So that was the standard it was called get wise and the drummer who was the keyboard player in the jazz band we were i was about 13 and a half years with them we never even had a harsh word nothing it was brilliant we played four nights a week so in the day i was filming on casualty and on the bill and in the evening i was singing <laughs> so i loved it people go, oh, isn't it a bit much? I went, no, no, I absolutely love it. I'm in my element. And when he passed, oh, we just bet. put 
carry that one on. So then I thought, I don't want to, I don't want to sing other people's songs now. I want to do my own. So I mm. set up Cardia, which means, by the way, Core, the deity. So it's the corn goddess. Ah, oh, I was going to ask so, you that. It's one of my questions. K O A R. Corn goddess. Cardia. Mm. And someone else said, but that means your heart. I said, well, that's okay. Because <laughs> if you put in cardia, it's cardiac arrest. Right, yeah. <laughs> cardia. So I went, I'm yeah. not changing it. That's it. But they said, oh, we, we know you as a jazz singer, as uh, Susan Marie. And I went, no, I'm having a pagan bad. That's what I'm doing. And Dan the Bard came to my house <clears throat> and he said, where's your music? And I went, my house burnt down. It's all gone. Well, and I said, my, um, you know, musical mentor has, has gone. I haven't sung for nearly 10 years. I said, I just can't do it. And he went, come on then, hurry up. <laughs> I was like, I was like, oh, well, okay then. And then I went on that journey, which was a personal journey. It's called The Journey, the Avery song. And it took nine years because my method for that album was my own personal journey of going round standing stones, being in ceremonies, like the winter, I've got the winter solstice song and I've got the summer solstice song because I was there at the ceremonies. I was there mm. and certain things happen. Not always, but certain things do happen. And um, and then I would think about, think about the song, um, put it together, take it around the camps for a year, if not two years. Avery was two years and hone it, hone the song. Slightly mm. changed Avery because everybody wanted to sing to make your way to Avery. And I went, no, I'm not writing it again. And they went, yeah, yeah, but we want to sing that bit. So I went, oh, all right then. So I'll stick it in twice. So take it around, then record it, then go back to the standing stones and send it back to the stones. Don't just take. So from Salisbury to Callanesh is 750 miles. So I was determined to go back and sing the song back to Avebury. Got some great black and white photos that a French person took of me. And, I, and as I arrive, don't forget, I've, I've driven hundreds of miles. I did stay overnight, by the way. I didn't, I didn't drive 750 miles. But um, I hear this shout go up. It's the singer. <laughs> but bloody hell. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, that was an escapade in, in itself because I, they said, be careful of the ditch, and I backed my car, my mini, uh, my um, micro Nissan into the ditch. <laughs> the tail ends going like this with all my equipment, and they went, "Don't worry about that. <laughs> we'll have it out in a while." Three blows, <laughs> oh, push my car out. <laughs> Didn't do it again, lads. <laughs> Bloody hell. <laughs> I'm stuck here <laughs> in the car like this. <laughs> <laughs> I just jumped in the ditch and heaved it out. So, but um, the, oh, I don't know, I'm wandering. The filming, because I've gone to Callanesh. So, you know, different things happen in different ways. Like, but the Stonehenge one of the winter solstice one is, was, at the time, bring back the bones protest. I see if I got that one here. I can't remember. Um, oh. oh, yeah. So, can honest you call to me? I don't sing this very often, actually. And the chorus is, we've gathered here a thousand times to watch the sun to rise. Pale is the winter solstice light on weathered stone and eyes. Now, the last verse is really important because Arthur Pendragon's words, some of his words are in it. And uh, it means a lot to me, that verse. And it says, the old ones are calling me, all buried in love and peace, were laid to rest, so stay to rest. 
for all eternity. The ancestor ancient kings, the guardians neath our feet, stone sentinels stand that circle our land, exalted warrior priests. So oh. his his thing is the ancient, you know, mm. all buried in love and peace were laid to rest, so stay to rest. So mm. that was my first and only protest song. <laughs> what a wonderful thing to protest about. Yeah. Though. But Sue, you've all you've also, Sue started to um put on your own events haven't you near stonehenge so yeah tell us about that i'm really i'm really excited because we're coming to play at one of them at the autumn you are you are <laughs> you're going to get there yeah. by hook or crook and crawl um definitely so many years ago i thought i really want to put on a camp and um my partner and i well um the one who's passed we went and we looked at so many places. There was a, a buffalo place. There was a forest. There was this. There was that. Um, always something in life stopped me from putting this camp on. You know, I saw a place that was a donkey sanctuary. I saw this. I saw that. I was like, oh. And then um, uh, I met via the war band, uh, lovely lady Elisa, Elisa Blackwood. And we were both members and we talked about putting on a camp again. Um, and there was no camp that was spiritual in this area. There are rowdy festivals, but there are no proper spiritual camps. So we went, right, we're putting it on. And we booked it into a certain place near Stonehenge and it became untenable. So we moved it to um, uh, just near Avebury. And uh, Woodbridge Inn, uh, which which closed not, not long afterwards. I don't think it was anything to do with us. <laughs> it wasn't actually. And so we called it Wild Spirit. So W Y L D E, which covers anyone who's spiritual. It, you don't have to be particularly a pagan. You don't have to be of this or that or anything. And the ceremonies are multi. I even put some Tibetan stuff in there. So, you know, all sorts of different people. And I invite everybody to have a little part of it. It's not about me standing there going, this is how it's all going to happen. So uh, we did that, the autumn equinox, and it went really, really well. So I was going to put it on there and then I thought ah oh, and I started to look at more I've been to about 35 sites and then my guitarist Tim says oh I forgot to tell you one of my best friends has got a campsite I went what <laughs> what have <laughs> you told me what have <laughs> you told me you know God sake, we meet yeah. every week rehearsing and I've been going, I don't know where to do it. <laughs> and so I'm like, oh, I didn't know you were that desperate. I said, well, yes, I am. And uh, it's at Martin, not very far from here. It's about 15 minutes from my house. So I'm this side of Stonehenge and it's just there. So I went to the site and it was quite an open. He does a lot of permaculture there, Nick does. And we met and we got on really well. And I could see the potential there. So the first camp back on that site, and all my camps will be on that site now. Um, uh, we, unfortunately, we don't have a pub serving us Sunday lunch. First time I've ever been at a camp and had Sunday lunch was the last one. <laughs> oh. But it has a kitchen and it's got nice things like that. And it's right near to... Uh, long barrows so I thought yeah I went and felt the ground and it was great um so I'm doing I've, I've decided to do four <laughs> because I said if that last one doesn't kill me <laughs> and if I'm mad enough I'll do ones that I feel like doing I've run healing camps before so I know how that goes and it's not 
that much different, but you've got to do bands, haven't you, or, or music of some description. Mm. So we're allowed a fire there, which is great. Brilliant. Um, which I think is, you know, nice, pagan. Mm. And I've got this one coming up on the 31st of May, I know, calling it Wild Spirit Fay. And the only reason for that is because it's summer, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> oh. And then the next one will be a healing camp which will be totally different in August. And uh, that will be all therapies. And I've hopefully got a harpist coming. That's it. Oh, lovely. No, no, no big musicy thing going on there. Oh. And then another autumn equinox one, which is, you know the date, the 13th to the 15th of the September. Yeah. yeah. And then the one after that, for hardy souls only, and because nothing else is happening around that period, around here, um, a winter solstice one. Oh. But all the stuff will happen indoors. But if you can stick a B Airbnb or a camping, you know, you can go for that. And next year is already booked. And I'm moving the date Aye. of a one to the summer solstice because that's what I wanted to do. I want big thing I want to do was the solstice and a healing camp. Mm -hmm. So any of that you can find on, on Facebook on Wild Spirit Events page. And you have to join mm. as a member. So one of the things I'm going to say is that you've got to be a member. And believe me. Of the group. I, of the group. The group, yes. Yes, yeah. on Facebook. So, yeah. So okay. that, well, okay, if you don't do Facebook, PM me or send to my email, but PM me or my email. Uh, okay. which is, yes, you can. I'll make up. sure I put all the links yeah. in, the, in the show description. Okay, that's brilliant. So, One more thing that I wanted to ask you about um, before we finish is your, because you don't just work in this country, do you? No. <laughs> Tell us about your international travels and services yeah tell us that's Yamanja from brazil i love her because they have i went to the museum and um they've got so many beautiful figures of her oh she's amazing who so is she, she? Comes, Yamanja. who is she a goddess she's a goddess wow she comes, she's the sea Gorgeous. with pearl, with pearls and water and she's got two sisters Beautiful. and but the person to teach you more about that would be alexander kabot so my mother's in the hospital things are not going too well and um pia from pagan tribal gathering uh, no previously yeah had put said there's a reverend coming to stay with you he wants to see um, you know, Stonehenge and all that stuff. I thought, Reverend, crikey, I'm going to have to clean my house up. <laughs> anyway. Clean your life up. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, something, whatever. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, he arrives and I'm like, oh, oh, hello, 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 Alexander. You know, like this. And he's like, and he's funny. And we, he said to me when he went back to New York, um, oh, I'll be going to Brazil to lecture because he used to go out there a lot. He's in the uh, Cabot, Lori Cabot tradition, but he has many other traditions. He was Cuban. So lots of different traditions. You know, uh, Lady Rhea, who does the candle magic, he, she, he's her high priestess, high priest, sorry. And um, I cheekily said, can I come? Quiet like. And he went, what did you say? Can I come to Brazil with you? <laughs> and he went, oh, all right then. So I buy a ticket. <laughs> I meet him. And we go. And um, that was that, that's another story for another time because the pandemic broke out while we were there. And so, oh. but I end up I end up singing in uh, the museum there. They've got a witch, witchcraft museum and uh, Claudio Pareto, he's the, I'm probably saying all these not correctly, but that's what it looks like to me. And mm. so he, I've sung there 
and now I think he's seen that I'm doing lectures and that. And um, Alexander phoned me the other day. We've been to Peru as well, and there's a lot of witches in Peru. I've done that. I've sung there. And so um, he said, did you put a like on um, the witch thing that's going on? I went, yeah, I did. I made a nice little comment saying, I'd love to come back sometime. And that was it. And then I went on with me cooking. Ten minutes later, he pho he messages me from, uh, well, phones me face to face. like, And he goes, you're going to Brazil in September. <laughs> so I went, oh, oh wow. am I? <laughs> How did that happen? But I'm going to lecture about my lecture Celestial Stones and I'll be singing there. How wow. did all that happen? Amazing. Because my mum said, travel, Susan, travel. <laughs> so, Excellent. yeah. Excellent. So I can now say Tintinational, trending Absolutely. in Brazil. Trending in Brazil. Oh, my God. Oh, do you know what? So it's been it's been lovely talking to you. And um, I've noted all those times you've said, that's another story because we'll have to have you on again and you'll have to tell us those stories. So I'll write those down. Um, <laughs> Oops. Yeah, I will. I will. Watch me. Watch me. <laughs> so, um, so what's next? What, I mean, you've talked about the, the camps coming. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, then I've also got an amazing event I went to last year and uh, it was, um, run by Melanie Surratt, uh, which was um, International Women's Drumming Convention. And uh, she'd seen me performing, I think at Pagan Tribal Gathering, by my lovely friend, Pia Morgan. And that's another beautiful camp I go to. And she uh, said, oh, will you play for them? And my two male band uh, members were the only honorary women there i kidded mm. them on they had to wear a dress honestly i <laughs> took it to the edge i took it right to the edge they were like well what what really oh gods <laughs> so funny but i had the most magical experience there imagine a hundred women with hand drums drumming my songs back to me it hit my heart. It, the room oh. was going whoa, 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 like this. And I didn't come down after that for pff, three weeks. <laughs> and we've been invited yeah. back to do it again in November. So I'm looking forward oh, to that. Wow. But one, okay. one thing um, I'll just slightly mention, but again, I think it's going to be one of them journeys. Like the, I thought people have often asked me to write a book. And I just really, because I'm so dyslexic, I, I've resisted. And I have to know how to do things. I do it by rote. And then I thought, well, what can I do about it? They went, oh, well, write about this, write about that. And I thought, no, I can only do it about my experiences. I can't do it about anything else. So I'm going to go around the Celestial Stones album. And I'm going to write a chapter about each one which is how I started off doing that lecture. So the lecture will be expanded into the first chapter. Anyone can read a book about Stonehenge, about the facts and figures. It was built mm. here, the blue stones were put there, la, 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 la. And there are many archaeologists who know heck of a lot more than I do, but I'm not writing about that. No. I'm writing about the magic that can happen in those places. And mm. sometimes it's difficult for for you to describe it. Mm. Um, but that's pretty much what I'm good at. So I thought, yeah. do what you're good at. So I'll do that one this year. Then I, I want to do Avery next after that. Mm. Uh, things that have happened there and all wow. around. That's a huge area. You know, you've mm. got You've got the sanctuary up the top. You've got, you've got the hill, Silbury Hill. You know, there's a whole complex there which joins itself to Stonehenge as well. So they are very much connected. So mm. that's the plan. Yeah. 
if I'm still on this earthly plane, that's what I'll be doing. You but... will be doing it. You will be doing it. I mean, somebody said to us the other day, um, you know, what keeps you, what keeps you feeling young? Um, and and I think it's the music. I think that yeah. it's the music and the, is the magic in our lives anyway, you know, and I can't separate music from magic. It's it's they're one and the same. And oh. which is why I say to people that come on on the show, you know, tell me how mu how magic expresses itself in your life. And I think with musicians, um, I resonate more than anybody else because I we all know how music changes us don't we music yes. and, and that's what it changes us and to to see that in other people in our audiences in in you know it's just it's just it's just magical well magical. I, it is and um the song I was talking about the sleep sleep one or right. rest your soul with um it was just when there was that break in the pandemic and I did a winter solstice on stage singing and I handed again lots of crystals out in the audience, over 250 crystals, little small ones. And I said, if you've lost somebody, just take one and we'll sing this together. And people were all crying. And mm. my, my guitarist said, Oh my God, we've made them cry. I said, that's okay. Mm. You can make them laugh. You can make them yeah. cry. You can do, yeah, I yeah. wouldn't say make, but it's an emotion that goes from you yeah. to you them. You touch people. You touch people, that's, don't you? I think, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. You touch yeah. people. And mm. your songs touch me. Oh, when, thank you. When, you know, yeah. when, when I was mm. just watching you. So... Mm. there's that connection um yeah well, well so thank please. you so much thank you so much for having me here oh and, thank you for coming on and i think the outtakes are going to be a lot more interesting than the actual interview <laughs> no no you. it's been great it's been great <laughs> but that you. was that was hard work getting there wasn't it it was hard work well, to actually get half an hour of sorting out your it was the disappearing the, the one that did it was the disappearing witch trick. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, on that note, thank you so much for coming. Thank and, you. Um, and I'll see you very soon. Okay. Right. <laughs> bye. bye bye, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.